Dedication and Chapter One of the Smoke Eaters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. The Smoke Eaters by Harvey J. O'Higgins. To Lieutenant E. D. F. of the New York Fire Department. Here is a book about our old friends the captain and the crew of Hook and Ladder Company No. Blank, with incidents that are taken from the Manhattan Bank fire, from the burning of the bark criffle, from your own adventures with that kike the firebug, and from a dozen other fires and truck-house dramas which you will recognize and recollect. Do you know how much of this book owes its being to you, to you and your experiences, and your inexhaustible good nature? I know that whatever there is in it of truth to life, of accuracy in detail, of honesty in point of view, is due, Lieutenant, to yourself. When you shall come to sit, like Captain Meaghan, a gentleman of leisure, retired on the pension which you have already earned a hundred times over by the saving of others lives and risking of your own may this volume recall to you the years of your most dangerous campaigning may it represent to you now the gratitude of that hard-driven newspaper tout who came to you so often to draw you out of a modest reticence with fool questions and may it carry to a larger audience than you had in him some appreciation of the burly life of those blue-shirted jigger-jumpers who live face to face with the very scorch of death eat smoke and spit black buttons and accept the call of a heroic duty as the merest bread-and-butter matter of their every day h j o h chapter one the red ink squad when the new chief took charge of the uniformed force of the fire department he swept its veterans into retirement with a broom the probationers crowded in to fill the vacancies and in three months captain meaghan found himself as he said sourly teachin kindergarten in the truck house of hook and ladder company number no. zero he ruled a shabby red brick building of three stories that stood between the knees of two downtown wholesale houses in a warehouse district where packing case fires gave the men the worst of punishment and the best of training it followed that the captain's role had more probationers and new men on it than any other and because the names of the probationers were entered in red ink these raw recruits were nicknamed in contempt the red ink squad they were teased and bullied by the older men they quarrelled among themselves disturbing the club quiet of the truck house leisure and they were despised by their captain who demanded of his new assistant where'll i be if i run into a big blaze with a gang like that he spoke as if he held lieutenant gallagher personally responsible for the condition of the crew gallagher tried to flatter him with an assurance that the chief sent the green men to him as a good master there's broderick has the same sort of district he said and he doesn't get em captain meaghan replied curtly he breaks their backs gallagher rubbed his chin they're not so bad taking them singly he considered but there's too many of them and those two guineas were a double dose too much he referred to two Italians, one of whom was called Dan Jordan, by the men, because his name was Giovanni Giordano, and he was good-natured, and the other was maliciously miscalled Spaghetti, because his name was unpronounceable, and he turned black when he got this substitute. "'They'll be sendin' me Chinese next,' Captain Meaghan growled, unmollified. "'They will,' the lieutenant said, "'as soon as the chinks begin to vote.' Captain Meaghan chose to resent that shot at the powers that ruled the department. "'Well,' he blustered, "'I wish you'd get into a worker, so's if you're the stuff that makes firemen I'd know it, and if you ain't, the chief'd know it, and cut it out.' And he had his wish. The alarm of the Torrance fire was rung in just before daybreak on a warm midsummer morning, while the men still lay sleeping in their bunk-room under the glow-worm glimmer of a lowered gas-jet 
They leaped from their cots with the simultaneous suddenness of the start in an obstacle race at the crack of the pistol, tugged on their turnouts of rubber boots and trousers with a muttering of growls and imprecations, vaulted beds while still hooking their waistband catches, threw themselves at the brass sliding poles in the corners, and shot down into the glare and noise and seeming disorder of the ground floor, where the horses were already tossing their great heads in their harness, and the driver was already bending forward in his seat, and the doors stood open on the darkness of the night. Captain Meaghan sprang into the light rig in which the absent battalion chief rode to fires, and swung out into the street with a sudden clatter of hoofs on the stone sidewalk and the burst and echo of a jangling gong in the dead quiet out of doors. The truck followed, fifteen seconds after the jigger had started the alarm, with little spaghetti climbing in over the tail of the bed ladders behind Long Tom Donnelly, who had the tiller of the hind wheels. That was a good start, but it was only the start. The driver was a new man, who was not new to driving, but who was new to driving a hook-and-ladder truck. He had been a coachman, and he knew all about horses. But for the seat of a five-ton truck, a man needs the nerve of a chauffeur and the shoulders of a Roman chariot racer, and he does not need to know a bridle from a belly-band. The new man had the nerve, but he lacked the shoulders and before they had rounded their second corner, Donnelly, on the tiller, was braced and ready for the turn at a gallop that might be a run on the rocks for him. It came within sight of the fire. The horses were already beyond control when the piping wail of a steamer sounded in their ears from a side street. The driver tugged and shouted. Three white horses with a shining engine leaped out of the darkness ahead of them, and Donnelly, with a great oath, wrenched the wheel of his tiller around to send the rear of the hook-and-ladder truck swinging for a lamp-post on the curb. The crash broke the rear running gear, and brought down the truck on the cobblestones hamstrung. The engine flashed past them, dropping fire. The collision had been averted, but little spaghetti had been thrown out on the stone pavement, and lay curled up on a sidewalk grating with a broken body. Donnelly crawled out from the ladders, his right arm hanging limp. The other men were unhurt. They had braced themselves against the shock by clinging to the side ladders. And, moreover, they had not received the terrific momentum of the full swing. They were on their feet about the fallen Nye horse when Lieutenant Gallagher called out to them to follow him on foot with such scaling ladders, hooks, and axes as they could carry and they stormed the truck for tools. Donnelly and Dan Jordan lifted spaghetti between them and carried him to a bed of lifelines covered with a coat. The crew disappeared around the corner, running heavily in their rubber boots. "'Be off now!' Donnelly ordered the Italian, and Dan Jordan followed the others reluctantly, looking back at his unconscious countryman as he turned into the side street. Now, the first truck company to arrive at a fire makes an entrance at doors and windows, and incidentally saves whatever lives are in danger. The second forces its way through an adjoining building to open smoke vents in the roof. The third is scattered, wherever its assistance is most needed to help the engine crews in stretching in new lines of hose, to tear down burning woodwork, to carry ladders and wield forcible entrance tools in the secondary movements which are made against a fire after its position has been developed. The accident which wrecked Gallagher's truck brought up Company No. 0, the third crew to arrive where it should have been the first. And that was how the probationers came to be separated from their elders, to face their trial in a body and alone. Captain Meaghan was already raging at the disgrace which their delay brought to him, and the danger which it brought to the first unsupported engine companies that had gone in against the fire. When he saw his men straggling in afoot, disordered, winded, and trailing their few tools, he threw his helmet at his feet and kicked it, cursing into the gutter. The new men gathered behind Gallagher and the front line of the company's old guard and waited like schoolboys for disciplining, with muttered asides to one another, which they spoke with their eyes on their feet. Pipemen shouldered through them, dragging hose. A water-tower almost ran them down. 
Shout answered shout around them, and when they looked up for their orders, Captain Meaghan stood bareheaded and raving before them, shaking an impotent fist at Gallagher and roaring unreportable abuse. Gallagher picked up his helmet for him from the gutter. The captain took it roughly and shambled off with it in his hand to report to the chief. The lieutenant was known as the mildest-mannered man that ever rolled to a fire. "'Much more like this,' he said, "'and the old man'll blow up and bust.' Sergeant Pym, who was biting a cud of tobacco from a companion's plug, rolled the morsel, bulging, in his lean cheek. He had no consolation to offer, so he gave the remainder of Parr's tobacco, and Gallagher accepted it with a mute nod of thanks. The occasion was plainly past words. The Torrance building before them was nine stories in height, a structure of granite pillars and red brick, used as a wholesale house by a chemical company on the ground floor, and as an office building in the upper stories. The fire was in the lower part of it. Already the dead lights in the sidewalk had been broken in with axes and mauls, and a cellar pipe was spouting its stream through the opening into the basement. Long lines of hose stretched from doors and hung from windows where the smoke puffed from gaping sashes, and men in helmets and rubber coats appeared for a moment to shout reports into the disorder below them and vanish again in the darkness. The roof of the seven-story building adjoining was alive with men who were raising ladders to the burning structure. It did not seem to Gallagher and his company that there would be much for number zero to do. They waited, the inglorious reserve in a battle which they should have led, in the smoking turmoil of pulsing engines, the cry of orders, and the hurry of men. They were roused from their inaction by Captain Meaghan, who charged down on them like a dog on chickens, and sent them scurrying in all directions, chased Lieutenant Gallagher, Sergeant Pym, and two probationers, Morphy and Fuchs, to the ladders with a shout to open smoke vents throughout the upper stories ordered three of the old men into the basement, with a whack of his helmet on their shoulders, and a yell at their heels, to aid the pipemen who were flooding the cellar. Thrust aside two others who carried axes, shouting at them, "'You come after me!' sent Parr, Dan Jordan, and a probationer named Doyle up the ladders after Gallagher's squad and then crushed his mudded helmet down on his head, and raced with the axemen for the ground floor, where a line of hose trailed from the black smoke of the doorway. That disposition of his men put the veterans of the company where they were most needed, in the cellar and on the first floor, to fight the fire at the fierce root of it, and it sent all the probationers aloft, in charge of Lieutenant Gallagher, to the less important and less dangerous duty of opening smoke vents. It is with these red inkers, only, that we are concerned. How the men in the cellar were driven back by the poisonous fume of burning chemicals, fighting in a water that was knee-deep, and in a smoke that stuck like sulphur in the lungs. How the flames got behind Captain Meaghan and the two men with him, and cut off their retreat from the burning ground floor. How they were rescued by their comrades, and taken unconscious to the hospital in the waiting ambulances. All this may not be told here. These were merely the trials of a valour that had been proved many times in fires not less difficult and dangerous. With the probationers it was a different story. While the battle below them was being fought and lost, they carried out their captain's orders to aid and relieve the engine companies manning the streams in the upper stories. They worked their way from the front to the rear of the building, and threw open the steel shutters of the black windows to let in the air and to let out the smoke. They found the pipemen fighting the vanguard of the fire that was coming up the elevator shaft. The blaze here was not dangerously large, the heat was not excessive. The only menace was the smoke, and Gallagher, with good judgment, cried on his little squad against it. Being without scaling ladders, they used the stairs, and worked with axe and hook-butt from the third story to the sixth, crashing down doors and beating out window-sashes, until they had a clean chimney-flue for the smoke that had been stifling the pipemen on the floors below. They were on the sixth story, ignorant of what had been happening on the ground floor, when an explosion of back-draft below alarmed them. 
Gallagher had supposed that the fire was well under control by this time. He had not known of the poisonous fume in the smoke. And the magnitude of the explosion indicated a great accumulation of gas, and therefore a fiercer flame and a greater area of heat than he had imagined. He ran to a window and hung out of it to see the men sliding down the ladders from the second story. A huge flame spat out from the ground floor, and he knew from the retreat and counter-rush, the scurry and confusion of the crews in the street, that the fire was carrying all below him, and that his escape would be cut off. He bawled down to warn them of his danger, and then ordered his squad to follow him by the stairs. They groped their way back through the dark passages, only to come on the deadly smoke which was pouring up stairs and elevator shaft in advance of an unchecked fire. A puff of it struck them like a hand at the throat, and they dropped to the floor to catch the low draught of cleaner air which is always to be found there. It was impossible to go forward. Gallagher led them back at a blundering run to the window. One look below convinced him that they were trapped. It was not possible for the men in the street to put up ladders to them. They themselves, because of the accident to their truck, were without scaling ladders or other means of escape. "'We're up a tree,' Gallagher said soberly. The new men, panting from exertion and excitement, and coughing from the irritation of the smoke in their throats, grew suddenly quiet, staring blankly at the lieutenant and at one another. They looked out at the street five stories below them, obscured in a belch of smoke. They heard the flames behind them singing in a fierce undertone in the elevator shaft. And when the Italian, Dan Jordan, began to jabber an appeal to all the saints to save him, which the men mistook for a dago profanity, they relieved their feelings in oaths of bewilderment and disgust. Sergeant Pym had been too busy to remember the quid in his cheek. Now he chewed thoughtfully. "'If we could crawl back and go higher,' he suggested, "'there ought to be a crew on the roof.' "'There's something in that smoke,' Gallagher said. "'Cellar and first floors full of drugs, chemical company. "'They're trying to get out the men down there. "'They're too blame busy to do anything for us.' Fuchs, the probationer, who had been a bridge worker, got out on the window ledge and craned his neck. "'Too far to jump!' Lieutenant Gallagher warned him. "'Sure,' he said, "'but here's a three-inch ledge that ought to run to the next building.' A few feet below the window-sill there was a projecting strip of ornamental stone facing that crossed the Torrance building with a stripe of grey on the red brick front. Pym looked down at it. "'Think we're giddy sparrows?' he complained. Dan Jordan peeped out and fell back from the window, waving an unintelligible protest. Fuchs drew off his rubber boots. "'If you'll put a hand tween my shoulders,' he said to Gallagher, "'I'll see how far it goes.' The lieutenant answered, "'Yes, wait a second. Knock that sash in, Parr.' Parr made a sashless gap of the window-frame with two blows of his axe. Fuchs swung over the sill, with Gallagher's hand in his collar, and found the stone ledge with his toes. "'All right,' he said. "'Brace yourself to hold me to the wall.' and let me get as far as you can." Gallagher straddled the sill, with Parr sitting on the leg that anchored him to the room, and gave Fuchs an arm's length, with a great palm spread between the probationer's shoulders. Fuchs edged forward, his ear scraping the bricks, until he could be certain that the ledge led to the windows of the next building. "'All right,' he said evenly. "'It's a long stretch, but I guess we can do it,' and came back inch by inch. This ledge joins a sort of cornice. Gallagher turned to the others. You do by each other what I do with Fuchs, he said. Morphy'll follow me, and then Jordan, and then Doyle and Pym. Parr, you'll have to anchor us here till Fuchs reaches the other window. Get your boots off, men. You'll have to get a grip with your toes. I got holes in my stockings, Pym said coyly. The men laughed, all but Dan Jordan. The accident to his chum, Spaghetti, had first broken his nerve. The blind, groping in the darkness and the smoke through an endless succession of bewildering passageways and offices, with a fire that seemed to him to be stalking them into the dangerous upper regions of the burning building, 
had added a child's fear to this weakness. The attempt to escape through the choking smoke, and the sudden realization of all his worst fears when that attempt had failed, had put him in a panic terror. And now, when he saw Gallagher's preparations to climb out on a ledge that no man could cling to, he lost his last control of himself, ran to the other window of the room, and screamed wildly out of it, Help! -a! Help! -a! His voice cut through the uproar in the street with the shrill sharpness of a steam whistle. He began to yell a frightened gibberish in a voice of crazy fear. Parr's hand closed suddenly on his throat, choked him from behind, and threw him back from the window, to fall in a hysterical grovel on the floor. "'There's a blamed fine mess,' Parr said to Gallagher. The lieutenant was thinking of the effect of it on the new men. He prodded Jordan with his toe. "'Get up,' he said sternly. The Italian covered his head with his hands, and wailed in his jargon. Gallagher kicked him in the side. "'Get up!' he ordered. "'Get up out of that!' Jordan rolled away from him in a paroxysm of terror. The lieutenant bent down, caught his hand in the probationer's collar, and, raising him to his knees, shook and strangled him till he gasped for breath. "'Get up!' he said, easing his hold on him. The Italian sprang to his feet, broke from the lieutenant, and ran toward the window, screaming. Parr grappled with him. He fought like a madman, with wild blows that fell on Parr's face and blinded him so that he loosed his hold to defend himself, and the Italian, slipping through his arms, jumped to the sill of the window. He crouched there a moment, huddled up with fear, and then, whether it was that he lost his balance or that he had been really driven out of his mind by this fire fright, just as Parr caught at his legs, he uttered a last frantic cry, and dived headlong into the street. They saw him fall, spread like a bat. Gallagher, with a roar of, "'Get back there!' drove the probationers from the windows before they saw the rest. He faced them. Morphy's lips were trembling. Doyle was laughing weakly. Parr wiped his forehead with a grimy hand. The lieutenant said in a low voice, that's what happens when a man loses his head. The noises from the street grew in their silence, until Fuchs, on the ledge outside the window, said reflectively, That's like Mullen did in the old cantilever, and Gallagher knew from his manner that he could depend on one of his probationers at least. He tried to encourage the others, and there was no need for it, he said. There's no danger about getting out of here, not a bit. The same thing's been done before. There was Rush did it, for the matter of that, at the Manhattan Bank fire. Get your wind now. There's no hurry. No, what's the use of hurrying? Pym said grimly. Jordan's beat us down already. Morphy shuddered. He felt sick and weak, he flushed hot and went cold in waves, and his knees melted into tremblings. He leaned against the wall. Doyle laughed brokenly at Pym. "'Pull yourselves together now,' Gallagher said, and the probationer's laugh choked in a catch of breath that was somewhere between a gulp and a sob. The lieutenant summed up in a glance. "'Just do what I tell you,' he instructed them, "'and don't be thinking of what might happen. Keep your eyes off that. See?' A puff of smoke warned him of approaching danger. He turned to the window and climbed out on the sill. "'We've got our hands full,' he said to Fuchs, "'and if either of those men goes dizzy, we'll all go down.' He lowered himself to a place on the narrow ledge. Fuchs then, with Gallagher's arm to support him, edged out against the wall. The lieutenant made room on the ledge for the next comer. "'Morphy!' he said. Morphy came trembling over the sill, with his teeth shut on his nervousness. "'Put your hand between my shoulders,' Gallagher ordered ignoring the man's condition, and let me and Fuchs go forward as far as you can. Morphy said, Yes, sir, gratefully. The two leaders edged forward. Pym's next, Gallagher said. With Pym in position, the chain stretched itself inch by inch across the wall. The noises from the street beat up at them like the sound of surf at the foot of a cliff to which they were clinging. 
A few more feet'll do it, Fuchs reported. Gallagher knew that he could not depend on Doyle. Morphy was frightened, but his pride tried to conceal it, whereas Doyle had laughed at his own weakness. And Gallagher knew enough of the psychology of fear to rate this last hysteria near the breakdown. Par next, he ordered. Par next, Morphy repeated huskily. You're next, Pym said in the cheerful voice of a barber to his customer. Billy, if you loves me, hold me close. Parr spat on his hands and lowered himself to the ledge. The men moved forward, Doyle in the window, holding Parr, Parr supporting Pym, Pym holding Morphy to the wall with an arm of iron, Morphy crushing Gallagher's broad shoulders with a pressure that spoke of overtense nerves, Gallagher steadying Fuchs and waiting quietly for the first signs of collapse in the man behind him. The smoke stung in their nostrils. The bricks scratched their perspiring faces. Their heels stood on nothing, and the cords of their insteps ached with the strain of their weight. "'My knees are getting weak,' Morphy said hoarsely. No one answered him. Fuchs was still going forward, and Gallagher's hand slid heavily across the little bridge-worker's back as they stretched their link of the chain to the breaking point. The lieutenant felt his fingers pass from the hollow of the probationer's shoulders to the ridge of his shoulder-blade, felt that drawn slowly under his palm, felt the ball of his thumb slipping over the shoulder. There was a crash of broken glass. "'Got my hold,' Fuchs reported. He passed beyond Gallagher's reach, and they could hear him beating in the glass of the window with his hatchet. He came back to put a hand behind Gallagher. The lieutenant changed the strain to his other arm. "'All right now,' he said to Morphy. "'Fuchs got me. You hold up, Pim. Tell Doyle to get out on the ledge.' "'I can't do it,' Doyle said to Parr. "'Stay there and burn, then,' Parr replied, moving away. "'Hold on,' he pleaded. He clambered out, white and weak. "'Oh, if I ever get out of this,' he said, "'it's the last the fire department'll ever see of me.' Fortunately, he was on the end of the line, and Parr held him up. The men worked their way along with a painful cautiousness. "'I feel like a blamed planked shad,' Pym said. He was answered only by the hoarse breathing of Morphy. Fuchs was already over the window-sill. Now Gallagher followed him. Morphy caught the sill and clung to it. "'I can't,' he panted. "'I can't lift my leg. It's paralyzed gallagher said cheerily come along then far enough so we can get pym morphy's teeth were chattering pym came grinning to the sash they dragged the probationer into the window and he collapsed on the floor i can't stand up he confessed shamefacedly i got wobbles in the legs they lifted doyle in and stood in a ring around morphy and him drawing deep breaths "'How are you, Doyle?' Gallagher asked. "'Oh, I'm out of this game,' Doyle said. "'There's easier ways of earning a livin' than this.' They did not answer him. Pym and Parr put an arm each about Morphy and raised him to his feet. "'I suppose we'll have to carry you down,' Pym said. He added at the thought of his unprotected feet, "'It'll just be my luck if this place is a tack factory.' Morphy staggered away from their support. I'm all right, he said. It was just in my legs, and that scared me. I thought I'd bring you all down if I went. Lord, how Jordan yelled! They straggled along in silence to the stairs, and were met there by a squad of men who had been sent to the roof to lower ropes to them, and had looked down to see them through the drift of the smoke clinging miraculously to the flat wall at the sixth story. A triumphal procession escorted them to the street. And that was the end of the Torrance fire, so far as the Red Ink Squad was concerned. Of the five probationers who had answered the alarm, only Fuchs and Morphy stood with Company No. 0 when the basement squad lined up with Gallagher's shoeless following at a neighbouring bar to drink the health of the crew. Spaghetti was in the hospital. Doyle had taken himself off to his home without handing in any formal resignation. Dan Jordan a ring of whispering men gathered around lieutenant gallagher with their glasses in their hands and heard of the end of him 
the saloon keeper came to listen to them across the bar gallagher saw him to the red ink squad he called they put their glasses to white teeth that flashed like negroes in the blackness of their smoke begrimed faces and to the fire that made them black pym added which as the sequel showed was at once a pun and a prophecy End of chapter 1「2 of the Smoke Eaters」by Harvey J. O'Higgins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Charge of Cowardice Captain Meaghan, running with a tossing lantern down the pier, at the head of his company, met Battalion Chief Tighe coming in the opposite direction. Tighe shouted, "'Get off the hatch! Powder and oil aboard!' and passed like a flying shadow of himself through the mist into the darkness. And that was all the information that Captain Meaghan got of the cargo that was smouldering in the Phoebe. He leaped over the bulwarks of the deserted boat, a three-masted sailing-vessel, bark-rigged, to find smoke curling up from the covering of the after-hatchway. There was no other sign of fire to be seen. "'Get her off, boys!' he cried, and the men attacked the hatch with their hooks and axes. He looked about him for his lieutenant. "'Gallagher!' he called. He got no reply. "'Where's Gallagher?' he cried, and there was no answer. Now Lieutenant Gallagher, at that moment, was coming at the double down the pier, having been delayed at the truck by the third officer of the Phoebe, who had been standing on the curbstone of the street, excitedly warning the fireman that there was powder aboard. He had fastened on Gallagher when he heard the lieutenant giving orders there, and Gallagher, having learned in unnecessary detail that the boat was loading with miscellaneous consignments of general merchandise, cartridges and kerosene, that the explosives were in the upper hold aft, and the general merchandise below them, that the oil was being put well forward, and was therefore not yet afire, had darted across the foggy street that was swarming now with police and firemen, and echoing with a hubbub of officers' voices, the whistles and bells of fire apparatus, and the clatter of horses' hoofs. Just as he reached the other side of the road, Battalion Chief Tighe had rushed out at him from the pier, had swerved to avoid him, tripped over the curb, and fallen heavily on the paving stones. Gallagher had stopped and run back to find another fireman raising the unconscious chief, and then, without waiting to aid, he had turned again and raced down the pier, eager to rejoin his company, so that Captain Meaghan might not have any smallest excuse for finding fault with him. They had not been getting on smoothly together. Captain Meaghan was of the old school, gruff and unlettered. The lieutenant, though he was a black and burly man, was as neat as a barber in his person, and officially careful in his speech. He had stood high on his civil service examination for promotion to a lieutenancy, and he knew it was the captain's opinion that a civil service examination for a fireman was as absurd as a preacher's license for a harbour pilot. He came breathless to the side of the Phoebe, while Captain Meaghan was still standing on the bulwarks above his men, giving them the light of his lantern on their work. The smoke was bursting through the broken hatch at every blow of the axes. "'Get it off, boys, get it off!' Meaghan coached them. He turned anxiously to look for the return of Tighe, since, in the absence of the battalion chief, he must rank in charge of a fire of which he knew nothing. And he saw his lieutenant. "'Tom!' he cried to Long Tom Donnelly. "'Go back and get a twelve-foot ladder.' "'Gallagher!' he greeted his assistant gruffly. "'When the hatch is off, get out that powder and throw it overboard.' He had understood, from Tighe's brief directions to him, that the oil was burning below the powder, and he knew that to flood the boat, in such conditions, would be to float the flame up to the explosives. Gallagher put down his lantern and went back to the bulwarks. He supposed that Captain Meaghan was afraid the engine company would be slow in coming up. He pointed to a squad of men dragging a line of hose through the misty circle of an electric light. "'Here,' he said. "'Here they are now!' Meaghan cried. "'Eh? What? What's that?' 
Here's an engine company now, Gallagher repeated. Well, supposin' it is. The lieutenant did not understand his tone. Can't they flood it out quicker? What's that? Meaghan shouted. Gallagher continued in his error. Can't we flood it out? Do you need to risk the men? Meaghan jumped down at him. By God, he said, are you scared? And raised the lantern on him. He had been wondering why Gallagher had hung behind the men. The hatch crashed and fell beneath the axes. She's loaded deep, Gallagher explained, confusedly, blinking at the light. We can sink her in no time, and the fireboats'll be here to help. What's the use? What's the use? Gallagher stormed. Afraid of your skin, are you? You're a fireman, eh? He cursed in a fury of contempt. Boys, he cried to the men. Gallagher put a hand on his arm. Look here, sir, he said thickly. Meaghan shook him off. Boys, he shouted, he's a scared to lead you down that hatch. He threw the light on Gallagher. The crew stared at him from the hatchway. The men of an engine company on the wharf shouldered to the bulwarks, asking, What's up? What's the matter? Long Tom Donnelly pushed his way through them with the twelve-foot ladder. It's a lie, Gallagher broke out. I say, what's the use of risking your men when you can— Meaghan drowned his voice in the bellow of a maddened beast. You take your orders from me, do you hear? Lead the men down that ladder, or I'll have you broke for the oil-headed, bandy-legged coward you are. Gallagher threw out a passionate hand at him. I'm just that much a coward, he cried, that you can't scare me with any threat of getting me broke. I'd be a damn sight worse coward if I'd be scared into leadin' men where they shouldn't ought to have to go. Meaghan turned to the men. You hear that, Pim? Hear that, Donnelly? I want you for witnesses. Now, he said, fiercely to Gallagher, get to hell out of this. Gallagher did not move. Meaghan swung his lantern to the engine company on the pier. Volunteers, he called. I want eight men to bring up this powder. There were twenty men shoving forward before the words were well out of his mouth. But his own crew were first. They lowered the ladder into the smoking hatch, and in the crowding and confusion that followed, Gallagher slid down into the hold, unobserved by the captain. Sergeant Pym, Parr, and Long Tom Donnelly went after him. He began to pass the cases of cartridges to Parr at the foot of the ladder. From him they were handed to Pym and Donnelly on the rungs, and from Donnelly they reached the deck to go from man to man and overboard with a splash. They worked with the quiet regularity of a trained bucket brigade. Gallagher stopped only once, to tie a handkerchief over his mouth. The other men had better air, the engine company aiding them with the shower of a spray nozzle, which fought back the smoke. Nevertheless, Parr had to be relieved, and three fresh men were sent down to fill the gap that was made in the chain, as Gallagher moved farther and farther into the hold. There were exactly two hundred and forty-six packages of explosives in the cargo, and Gallagher, while he toiled over them with bruised hands, half stifled and maddened by the heat, cursed the stupidity of the captain who had set him the task of taking them out. For himself his world had come to an end. He had been held up to his crew as a coward, and he would be dismissed from the department for insubordination. That scene on the deck of the Phoebe, of him standing in the light of the captain's lantern, his men eyeing him from the shadow, and Meaghan crying out to them, Boys, he's a scared to lead you down that hatch, possessed him in the darkness like a delirium. He went over his arguments as he worked. He protested against the injustice of the captain's charge. He fought against the folly of the captain's orders. But the shame of it all persisted, the light of the lantern was an eye of flaming contempt on him, and Meaghan's great voice rang out his infamy with a coward, coward, that was a bell booming in his ears. He struggled with the cases of cartridges, muttering to himself, sick and dizzy. And every minute that he worked was a minute wasted. That was apparent now to Battalion Chief Tighe, who had come back to the boat with his head bandaged, and who was storming about on the deck above ordering squad after squad down the ladder to aid and relieve those below. 
it was impossible to turn a full stream into the burning vessel while the men were in the hold it was equally impossible to recall them and attempt a redistribution for a new attack for the fire had gained such headway that it could not be drowned out now before it would reach the explosives it was plain from the lightness of the smoke that the merchandise was afire and not the oil and tig chafing at the situation censured megan for his misjudgment in a volley of oaths that drove the old captain smarting and humiliated into the file with his men to work there like a private passing cartridges across the deck the crew of a hook and ladder truck were opening the forward hatch a second crew had been ordered into the captain's saloon to open the hold from the stern line after line of hose had been laid along the pier the New Yorker had come up whistling through the fog, and was fighting with a wrecking tug to get alongside the Phoebe. Everything was ready, everything seemed to pause and take breath, for the attack that should drown the fire in a deluge from a score of pipes. And then suddenly, from the bow of a boat, came a cry of alarm. A spurt of flame shot up a ruddy reflection on a burst of smoke. The thud of a small explosion shook the decks. There was a ringing shout of, Oil's afire! Oil's afire! And a second can burst like a bomb. Tig roared, Get the men out! All ashore! And the firemen, who had swarmed like pirates from peak to poop, went over the sides to the wharf as if from a sinking ship. At the first sign of danger, Captain Meaghan had dropped into the afterhatch, and called to the men there to save themselves. Four dashed up the ladder from the smoke, but the smothered voice of Gallagher cried back to him, "'There's only three cases!' And Meaghan groped his way forward to see Sergeant Pym and the lieutenant getting out the last packages by the light of a dim lantern. The captain shouted, "'Oil's loose!' Pym took a case of cartridges and ran to the ladder with it. Before he could get back, the flames burst in on Gallagher in a gush of burning kerosene that lit up the hold like a bonfire in a cave. Meaghan sprang to his lieutenant's aid. Gallagher passed him a box. He hurried back with it to Pym. The sergeant caught it from him and started up the ladder. And Meaghan turned to see Gallagher staggering from the flames, with the last package of explosives in his hands, and the burning oil blazing around his feet. The report behind the lieutenant filled the air with fire and threw him forward. Meaghan caught him as he fell, and dragged him to the ladder. There, having passed the case of cartridges to Pym, he raised the unconscious Gallagher to his shoulders and climbed heavily to the deck. But quick as they had been, the fire had been quicker. From the forward hatch the flames had leaped into the shrouds and the rigging, and from there had reached the ten-gallon tins of oil, lying, ready for loading, on the pier. The heat of midsummer had dried the planks of the wharf, and they flared up with the oil like a laid fire. On the other side of the pier, and nearer the street, a tramp freighter from the southern coast had been discharging a carton of cotton, and when Meaghan reached the deck, a pile of these cotton bales was blazing, and the pier between him and the shore seemed to be flaming in a smother of smoke. He could see the men running and shouting hither and thither in the road. The fireboat had backed away from the Phoebe and had trained its big monitor on the bales and the oil cans, and the powerful stream scattered and swept them across the pier in a torrent. It was impossible to run that gauntlet of smoke, fire, and water and Meaghan knew it. He laid Gallagher on the deck, stripped the smoking outer clothing off him, tore the handkerchief from his mouth, and began to fan air into his lungs with his helmet. It was air as hot as the stifle of an oven. "'We can't spend the night here, I guess,' Pym said, as he tossed the last box of powder overboard. "'Take him up on the poop deck,' Meaghan replied. A choking cloud blew over them from the glow in the afterhatch. They carried Gallagher up the companion ladder to stretch him out beside the skylight of the saloon, and they were met there by three firemen who had been cut off at their work in the stern, and who came groping up the stairs from the saloon to the poop deck to ask, "'What's up, eh? What's up?' "'All hell's up,' Pym said. "'We'll have to swim out, I guess.' Meaghan looked around him. 
where's that wrecking tug they were shut off from the sight of shore now by the thick smoke that rolled up like the belch of a liner's stack shot with flames at its base a burning curtain of smoke from which a furnace heat was blown in scorching puffs into their faces they could hear only that pulse of indistinguishable noises the roar and crackle of fire the hiss of water and the throbbing of steam pumps which shakes the air in a dull tremble that deafens the ear as a too great glare of light blinds the eye behind them a glowing haze of smoke and fog hung down to the water the new yorker ought to be over there one of the firemen said they planned to swim to her meaghan said get me some water pim and began to work over the limp body of his lieutenant the glass in the saloon skylight cracked and fell tinkling smoke began to curl up through the vents gettin too hot for me a fireman said kicking off his rubber boots me too another agreed following his example the third stripped to his underclothing and walked aft and then pym at the rail yelled hoarsely oil's afloat we're cut off from the fireboat and the three men, knowing that if they delayed until the burning oil surrounded them, they would be beyond hope, ran to the stern and dived overboard. Pym threw off his coat. He and Captain Meaghan dragged Gallagher to the taffrail. They tore loose a life-boy that hung there. They leaped with the unconscious man into the water. The shock and coolness brought the lieutenant to his senses. He came up choking and spitting with Meaghan's fingers twisted in his collar, and he splashed and beat the water wildly with his hands. Pym thrust the boy at him. "'Get a hold of that!' he shouted, and Gallagher clung to it. The captain had been compelled to jump overboard with his boots on, and for a time he was busy trying to get free of them, while Pym kept him afloat. "'Where am I?' Gallagher gasped. "'You're in the bay,' Pym answered. "'Can you swim?' yes gallagher said well kick out then pym advised him there's considerable warm oil comin this way he added we'd better get out as far as we can cross the current oil'll be loose in the other slip there meaghan having rid himself of his boots breasted a small wave with a long stroke and pym and gallagher struck out beside him the lieutenant pushing the life-boy ahead of him as he swam he was trying to recollect what had happened to him, but he did not waste his breath in asking questions. He was weak, and the water splashed up irritatingly in his face. They swam in silence. "'There ought to be some... some tugs round here,' Meaghan said at last. Pym raised his shoulders, treading water, and stretched his neck. "'Ship ahoy!' he shouted. Voices answered out of the mist to their right. "'That's them three swimming down the piers,' he said. Meaghan turned on his side and swam in that direction, and the others followed him, borne along on the tide. Gallagher had come upon a confused recollection of his quarrel with his captain, and he paused to frown at the glare of the fire behind him. When he looked around again, a little wave struck him smartly in the face, to remind him of present things and he coughed the salt water from a throat and nostrils that were already sensitive with heat and smoke. Pym growled sympathetically, "'We've been smoked. We'll be pickled now.' Gallagher did not reply. He speculated on the back of Meaghan's head, bobbing before him in the water, and he wondered what the thought was under that matted grey hair. For himself, he felt as if he had been wakened from a bad dream by the cold water, had been wakened to a world of new efforts and new opportunities of which a man might take advantage regardless of the past gallagher was an optimist he shook the memory of that charge of cowardice from his thought with a toss of his head and breasted forward they had been swimming for what seemed to him an eternity of fog and splashing water with the boats of the east river blinded and peevish in the thickness of the july night lowing and complaining to one another forlornly in the faint distance when he heard the throb of marine engines somewhere to their left almost at the same instant meaghan raised himself and roared halloo halloo there in a voice like the blast of a foghorn gallagher caught the low pinhole gleam of a red port light it's a tug he said 
"'All aboard!' Pym shouted. They wheeled into line toward the boat, which began to show at the foot of the haze. "'Ship ahoy! Man overboard!' Pym cried. "'All right,' Meaghan said. "'They're coming!' The green light showed beside the red as the tug bore down on them. They could see a man in the bows, and they yelled a warning to him not to run them down. The hemp-fendered nose of the boat was not three yards from them when it stopped. A moment later Gallagher had caught the rope end, and, with the assistance of Pym and Meaghan, had climbed up the low side to the deck, to find himself weak in the knees and top-heavy. He leaned over the side to give a hand to his captain, and Meaghan made a sound in his throat that might have been intended for a gruff and unmollified thanks. Pym came up the rope hand over hand, and Gallagher turned away to dance the water out of his ears and to frown to himself at Meaghan's manner, for it was a manner that brought all his troubles back on him, the heavier for the unreasoning interval of relief. The captain of the tug, McVicker was his name, took a clay pipe from his hairy lips to ask them impolitely where they had come from. Gallagher looked up, but did not answer. Meaghan took no heed whatever. Pym nodded his head in the direction of the fire, and continued to wring water from the legs of his trousers. "'Blamed pants done for,' he complained, with the resentment of a man who has to buy his own uniform. "'What's a fire?' McVicker asked impatiently. "'Everything in sight,' Pym said. "'Any boats?' "'Ought to be. Oil's afloat.' McVicker saw a prospect of salvage money. "'Full ahead!' he shouted to the engineer, who was leaning from the window of the engine-room. The tug shot forward on the kick of the screw. It had not gone ten yards before there was a far call from the water, and Meaghan turned to see the three remaining firemen swimming toward them. "'Hold on! Hold on! Pick up those men!' he cried. The tug captain looked around to ask, "'Who's running this boat?' Now, if either Gallagher or Meaghan had been asked that question in the tone of mere inquiry, it would have taken them an appreciable time to make an answer to it, for they were as slow of mind and as slow of speech as all men whose lives are spent in action, not in thought. But what Gallagher heard was not the words, but the tone of insolent defiance in which they were spoken and before a man of thought, unaccustomed to action, could have made up his mind that McVicker intended to abandon the three firemen struggling in the water, or, at best, before such a man could have begun to decide what to do to make the captain and the tug wait to rescue the swimmers, Gallagher had flung himself on McVicker and gripped him by the throat. He knew that McVicker had a tugboat crew of at least five, but he was full of a dumb resentment against Meaghan and he was hungering for a fight. He throttled McVicker, backing him to the bulwarks, tripped him as he staggered, and dealt him a blow that broke his clay pipe in his teeth, and toppled him overboard as he fell. He struck the water with a wild yell and went under. "'Look out for the mate!' Meaghan shouted, and closed with a burly deckhand. Pym and Gallagher grappled with the mate, and wrested a revolver from him. "'Over he goes!' Pym grunted, putting in a body-blow that doubled the man up. They threw him, writhing, across the bulwarks, then heaved him over, head first. Before his shrill cries had time to grow faint in the wake of the tug, Meaghan, leaving the deckhand lying unconscious, with his head against the housework, ran forward to the wheelhouse. "'The engineer!' he cried, as he went by. Pym and the lieutenant charged down on the engine-room. The boat made a wide circuit in the water, running like a chicken without its head. Then it shivered and stopped short. Meaghan came out of the wheelhouse, wiping his mouth with the back of a bleeding hand. He nodded to Gallagher, who joined him from the engine-room. "'All right,' he said. "'I guess she'll wait to pick them up now.' She waited, rocking gently in the fog, with the three firemen standing in a little circle, back to back amidships. Gallagher was facing the engine-room with the mate's revolver in his hand. Captain Meaghan was watching the wheelsman in the bows. Pym was standing with a coil of rope, ready for Captain McVicker and his mate, who were swimming up together. "'Hold on to that,' he said, tossing the rope-end out to them. 
and don't try to come aboard till I say the word, or I'll step on your face. You'll get thirty days for this, McVicker screamed. You dirty river pirates! Pym laughed. Whoop her up, he called to the three firemen who were swimming feebly toward them. We can't keep this ocean liner waiting all night for you. When they had the three men aboard, they left the engineer and the wheelsman to assist the captain and the mate over the side, and went forward to the bows, regardless of the curses of McVicker and the abuse of the mate. "'Better take this, sir,' Gallagher said, apologetically, to Megan, handing him the revolver. "'No, I don't want it. I don't want it,' Megan said, and turned away from him to watch the fire grow and brighten as the tug swung round again and cut through the water toward it. McVicker shouted from a safe distance, "'I'll fix you!' They did not reply. The men, feeling the constraint of Megan's ill temper, drew away from the two officers and sat down on the sides of the boat. Gallagher waited for his foreman to speak. There had always been an unfortunate silence between them, and now, to the lieutenant's misunderstanding of his captain, it was the silence of the most implacable anger of an unreasonable old man. "'Oil hasn't spread,' Megan growled at last. "'Fireboat's keeping it back, I guess,' Gallagher replied curtly from his experience, knowing how those vessels would sweep the water with their streams, and brush back and round up the burning oil until it burned itself out. "'I guess,' Megan agreed, and returned to his moody silence. They could see, across the flame-lit water, a fleet of tugs crowding on the starboard quarter of the southern freighter that had been lying on the other side of the Phoebe's pier. She was burning in her upper works. The tugs had lines aboard her, and were dragging her out, stern first, into midstream. Megan turned. Did you know where the oil was? Gallagher frowned. Of course, he said in a puzzled tone. One of the mates told me. Megan muttered a disgusted curse on his own stupidity and looked away. Gallagher stared at him. Why, he said, I thought, I thought you knew. The captain shook his head. He replied in a moment, Tige didn't tell me. There followed a laboriously thoughtful silence for Gallagher. He said at last, fervently, Hell. It was his apology, and the captain accepted it without a word, dumb and dispirited, and gazing blankly at the swarm of tugs fighting around the freighter. But when Pym called out, There's the New Yorker. We could get aboard her. Megan spun around and shouted savagely, "'Tell him to shove the tug in alongside her, or, by God, we'll tip the whole damn crew of em into the drink again!' They found it easy to get transferred to the fireboat, but impossible to get ashore from her until the fire had been put out, and when they finally reported to Battalion Chief Tige for duty, there was nothing for them to do. He looked them over with a mildly threatening eye. Get back to your house and get dried, he said. Take my rig. I'll come up on the truck, he added to Gallagher and the captain. I want to see you two. And he saw them, and he heard them, through an hour-long conference that kept the crew hushed in awful expectation in their bunk-room on the other side of Megan's office door. Pym refused to answer any questions for the men, and went off to sleep but Long Tom Donnelly, with one eye open for promotion, lay waiting to be summoned as a witness of the lieutenant's insubordination, and listened to the growl of voices in the office, wakefully. When Tige came out, at last, he was smoking one of Megan's cigars, and Donnelly, from his cot, got a glimpse of Gallagher, as the door opened, sitting at his ease beside the captain's desk, breathing the fragrant blue, and puffing at another of the old man's cheroots. And Donnelly was the only one dissatisfied with that ending of the affair. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Smoke Eaters by Harvey J. O'Higgins This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Circumstantial Evidence 
It was a wet October night, and Sergeant Pym was doing his turn of duty as house watchman at the desk, with the blurred light of a street lamp staring blearily at him through the open door, and the truck-house clock ticking off his stretch comfortably above him. A man drifted in from the fog to catch on the chain that sagged across the doorway, and asked the time in a broken English and a tone insidiously meek. Pym focused an absent eye on him without answering, for the hour was plain on the clock there, and the man was a tenement quarter foreigner, in a misfit of cast-off clothes. Silence did not discourage him. He looked up at the timepiece. Nine, he said. Is it sure? Pym chose to receive that question of the accuracy of the clock as an insult to the house, and to accept, as an added insolence, the manner in which it was asked with a yellow-toothed leer, at once wheedling and sly. He raised his eyebrows to an impossible height on his forehead, in a monkey trick he had as the clown of the company, and then drew them down in a portentous scowl of eye-blazing rage, puffed cheeks, and bristling moustache. And the man at the door, hiding his grin, at once, in a hairy growth, as coarse as the beard of a coconut, which covered his face from his eyes to his throat, began to jabber a frightening explanation of how he had to meet a friend in Park Row at nine o'clock. Long Tom Donnelly, who was pitchforking the bedding for one of the horses, called out to him in the tone of a threat. "'Vot's dot, eh?' The man turned his head to flash a side glance at the stall with an evil glisten of the whites of his eyes, and, at sight of Donnelly's sallow face, he sidled away from the door and disappeared in the fog again. The wrinkles of Pym's good-natured smile subsided slowly into a blank placidity of face. He fondled his moustache on a pouted lip for a vacant-minded minute or more. Then he clasped his hands over his waist and twirled his thumbs for another bored interval. Finally he threw back his head in a sleepy yawn at the clock. The hands of it marked fifteen minutes after nine. His eyes opened as his mouth suddenly shut. He twisted his neck and stared. Nine, is it? he muttered. And that ain't more'n five minutes ago. He got up and walked uneasily to the door, to peer down the street, choked with yellow mist, in the direction which the man had taken. And it struck him, then, that this was not the direction in which Park Row lay. He came back to Donnelly. Ever see that mug before? he asked. Sure, Donnelly drawled lives on top floor down street. Pym studied the clock. He got a friend of mine run out of there once, Donnelly went on. Said he was stealin' when he was upstairs peddlin' clean zine, he added dryly. I reported him for not havin' enough fire escapes. Pym fingered his chin. You'd know the place if you saw it? I guess yes, Donnelly answered with grim conviction. Pym turned on his heel. All right he said. Take this desk a jiffy. And he started up the stairway three steps at a bound. Donnelly had a habitual pose of critical imperturbability, and he leaned on his pitchfork to watch Pym's ascension now, in a cool contempt for his waste of energy. He heard him rap on a door above stairs. He heard the captain's deep voice answer. He heard the door closed with a careful click of the lock. When he put up his pitchfork and went to the desk, he sat down with an expression of bored superiority and resignation. Pym and he were the oldest members of the company, but while he carried himself always with a dignity and reserve befitting his wisdom and experience, Pym played the fool for the sake of being popular with the men, and scoffed at Donnelly's pretensions with a freedom that left no friendliness between them. Their intercourse was an affair of mutual antipathy, occasionally relieved by outbursts of mutual contempt. Donnelly, therefore, did not worry his calm with any speculation as to the cause of Pym's excitement. He did not move even when he heard the door upstairs opened again, and heard the captain call, "'Take Donnelly! I'll put another man on the desk!' Pym dropped down the sliding pole beside the truck. "'Come along with me, Tom,' he said, fumbling among the forcible entrance tools. "'We're going to make a call.' Donnelly licked his lips. "'What's doin?' "'That's what I want to know,' Pym said. "'Does your friend live top-floor front?' 
No, back. Pim came around the truck, buttoning the company's long jimmy under his coat. Fire escape, eh? Donnelly nodded. Up the back. What's doin'? Pim laughed, irritatingly. Nothin', he said, or a surprise party for your friend. Get a move on. He ducked under the door chain, and Long Tom followed as gracefully as a camel. They turned down toward the waterfront, Pim setting a pace that did not suit Donnelly's dignity, and maintaining a silence that was annoying to his pride. "'Did you ever prove an alibi?' the sergeant asked at last. Donnelly growled. "'Kinda gay, ain't you?' "'Oh, I don't know,' Pim retorted. "'Not's gay's you'll be, if his whiskers ain't expectin' to collect insurance on his beddin'.' And Donnelly closed his thin lips on a sudden understanding of the situation. Pim spat in a manner of importance. "'When one of those gentry gets interested in drawin' attention to the time,' he said, in a tone of superior knowledge, "'it's like's not he wants witnesses that he weren't at home about then. See? Get a gait on!' Donnelly reluctantly swung a quicker stride. "'There's more things to be learned on the east side,' Pim added, "'than comes out in a civil service exam.' And that was a thrust at Donnelly's ambition to qualify for a lieutenancy. They hurried down the greasy flagstones, in a fog so thick that they could not more than see the disembodied phantoms of the street lamps, hung weirdly in their halos across the road. "'He's watchin' around here somewheres, I'll bet,' Pim said. Keep in the dark best you can." Donnelly stopped short before an open door that gave on a hallway as dark as a sewer. "'This is whole?' Pym said. Donnelly grunted. They groped their way through the narrow passage into a small court, dimly lit from the windows of a rear tenement that fronted on it. "'He's up on top,' Donnelly explained sulkily. "'They're dago trimmin' factories underneath.' "'Good enough,' Pym said. There's no lights, is there?" They could see none. Pym found a peddler's pushcart in an angle of the wall, and they wheeled it over noiselessly to upend it against the bricks beneath the first balcony of the fire escape. Donnelly gave Pym a lift from it, and the old sergeant swung himself up to the ladder with the ease of long training in life-saving drill. He was a small man, and he went up the iron rungs as nimbly as a boy. He saw no lights in any of the windows until he came to the top floor, and there, though a blanket had been tacked up inside the glasses, a glimmer of light showed through a large rent in the improvised blind. He put his eye to that peephole. He saw a table in the middle of the room with a large glass oil lamp set in the centre of it on a torn and discoloured lace curtain that had been spread for a tablecloth. He saw above the lamp a string of herrings hung there ostensibly to dry, and knowing the methods of East Side arson, he did not need to be told that there was somewhere in the room a hungry cat, whose part it was to draw down the tablecloth and upset the lamp in attempting to climb on the table to get at the fish. He took his jimmy from under his coat and forced the window stealthily. Then he raised the sash, propped it with the tool, and lifted a corner of the blanket. A cat was crouching in a corner of the room, where it had been eating the tail of a herring. He put aside the blanket, and clambered in, smiling sarcastically. "'Old devil forgot to hang em all for you, eh, puss?' he said. The animal answered with a frightened meow. "'All right,' he laughed, "'just as you say. But it's lucky I found you at this instead of his whiskers.' He pushed back his cap from his forehead, and pursed his lips coaxingly. "'Poor puss, poor puss,' he said. "'Give me a grip on the back of your neck. That's the way. Come along now. Never mind your grub. I'll fix that for you. Come along.' He carried it to an open door that showed the long tables of a sweatshop sewing-room, and he shut it in there. "'Now,' he said, scratching his ear, "'the next thing, the next thing, is to get a hold like that on Tommy's friend.' He looked thoughtfully around the squalid room that was at once kitchen, bedroom, dining-room, and parlour. A double bed had been drawn up near the table, and the soiled coverings had been thrown over the side of it to make a trail for the flames. He nodded. "'The old man and the old woman,' he said. A mattress lay in the opposite corner under a spread of old clothes. "'And the kids,' he added. He took his chin in his hand. "'Now, 
If he's sent the family off for the night, I can do it. If he ain't... He went out the window again, and slid down the ladders to Donnelly. "'Tell the cap'n,' he said. "'It's the old game, the cat and the oil lamp. Tell him I'm going to wait here, to lay for the man. And look, now, when you've reported, come back to the corner of the street, see? And get in the shade by the alarm box. And when I yell, fire, send her in.' Donnelly grumbled. "'What are you doing?' Pym said curtly, "'I'm going to help your friend collect his insurance.' "'He's no friend of mine,' Donnelly complained. "'I want to get to bed.' "'You'll get to bed for he will,' Pym said. "'You can bet on that. Make your sneak now. I'm in charge here.' Donnelly turned unwillingly into the hallway, and the sergeant ran back up the ladders. He cut down a clothesline that was stretched from the fire escape, stripped off his uniform coat, and left it with his cap on the balcony, jumped into the room, dropping the blanket behind him to conceal the open window, and began rapidly to tear up the bedspread into narrow strips, which he rolled and knotted into a small hard ball. Then he cut up the clothesline and began to plait the pieces together into various lengths of twisted rope, working busily in the lamplight, without raising his eyes, and every now and then laughing a lean, dry chuckle over his thoughts. When he heard a footstep on the stairs, he sprang back into a corner where the leaf of the open door would cover him. A hand fumbled at the knob. He closed his fist on the rag ball which he had made, and tossed the cords over his shoulder. A key grated in the lock with a sound that set his nostrils twitching over the tickle of a bristling moustache. The door was opened cautiously, and hung so for a dozen stealthy breaths. Then the man stepped in and shut it and Pym, with one swift stride forward, struck up at the base of the man's skull between the rim of his broken derby and the greasy collar of his coat. His hat leaped in the air, his head snapped forward, he threw out his hands with a sickening grunt. His knees broke, and he came thudding down in a heap on himself like a buckled wall at a fire. Pym pounced on him, and tied his hands together behind his back. Then he rolled him over to thrust the rag-ball into his mouth and bound a twisted strip of blanket around his jaw, to hold the gag. Finally he leaped back to lock the door, and said grimly, "'Got you!' Lifting the unconscious man into a chair, he tied him, hands and feet, to the back and legs of it. And when he had tried all the knots for the second time, he got a jug of water from a basin on a box in the corner, emptied it over the bowed head, and sat down on the edge of the table to wait. There was a long, shuddering sigh of returning consciousness. The dripping head began to lift slowly. The body stiffened against the cords with a start as the man looked up, and Pym smiled and smiled into a pair of wide and blinking eyes until they narrowed in a pucker of keen wrinkles under the lowered brows. The sergeant nodded. "'Just got here in time,' he said genially. "'I was afeard your friend in Park Row might keep you late.' and that little illumination of yours been delayed too long as it is. Your people'll be coming in on it." The man made a stifled noise in his throat, looking down at the rope around his waist and the knots at his ankles. "'Don't worry about them,' Pym said. "'I'll look after them. Your cat—' The gleaming eyes shifted in a quick search of the corners of the room. Pym smiled. "'Your cat don't know its business. What you want is to train that cat. You can't expect it to pull off a job like this without practice, see?" The man's eyes set in a glazed stare of stupidity, which Pym had seen before in the faces of men no less cunning. He smiled again, with a more contemptuous curl of the lip. "'What I move we ought to do,' he said pleasantly, "'is just educate him. We ought to give him a fair chance. And if he don't do the stunt the first time, we ought to let him try again. What do you say?' I've a lot of faith in that cat. I believe he can pull off the game all right. He's got a look like you about his whiskers, that's why." He got down off the table and crossed the room to open the door of the sweatshop. He called the cat, and it came to him, tail erect, trustingly. He took it up, purring, in his arms. The chair creaked with the stealthy strain of muscles against the cords as he came back. "'If you're not comfortable in that seat,' he said sarcastically. Take another. 
He sat down on the bed and stroked the cat. You see, he went on smoothly, the thing's like this. A man's got a right to hang up a herring or two to dry, over a table with a lamp on it. Sure, he has. And supposin' there's a cat in the room, a cat that's got a nose for fish. And supposin' he knocks over the lamp and starts a fire, and burns a house or so, and a half-dozen women and kids, and blisters up a crew of firemen, or maybe kills some. Well, ain't the house insured, and don't the firemen get paid good wages? Sure they do. There's no kick comin' on that, eh, puss? The kick comes about the cat. The cat loses his life, and don't get nothin', not even a chaw of fish. Eh, puss? And that's what I say, too. A man that's got his beddin' insured ought to stay and look after his cat. He leaned over to glare at his trust victim. Now, he said, in another tone, no jury on the island would find you guilty of attemptin' arson on a game like this. Neither'd I. What proof have I got that the cat had upset the lamp? Maybe he wouldn't upset it at all. You get the benefit of the doubt, sure, and I'm going to give it to you. He got up and raised the cat to give it a sniff of the fish. I don't feel equal to deciding this case, he said. I'm going to leave it to the cat. He put it down on the floor, and it mewed hungrily up at him. I'm going to leave you and the cat in here together. And if the cat don't go after the fish, you're acquitted, on circumstantial evidence. And if the cat do go after the fish, well, this house is insured, and, and the firemen are paid good wages. And you, you, he broke out suddenly, you sneakin' firebug, you'll fry in your own pan here, you'll bake in your own fire here, you'll cook with your rank fish here till there ain't the small end of a cinder of your left. And if I know the jury that'll sit on your thief's soul, then so welp me you'll sizzle, sizzle, sizzle till the everlastin' end of everything after that. The man had listened, staring blankly, with no signs of understanding. But now, when Pym put aside the blanket that covered the open window, and reached his cap and coat, the sight of that uniform startled him into a futile struggle of drawn neck and tugging shoulders. His breath fluttered in a quivering nostril. His eyes, bared of the lids, swam big with fear. "'Know what's coming now, eh?' Pym sneered. "'I thought you'd wake up.' He put on his coat and his cap with the air of a workman who has finished his day's job. He locked the door of the sweatshop coolly. He stepped back to the window. "'I'd like to stay and hear your verdict, puss,' he said, straddling the sill but there's likely to be an alarm of fire rung into the truck-house pretty soon. I got to get back." He dropped the blanket, climbed out on the fire escape, and closed the window with a slam. Then he began to raise it again, inch by inch, with the care and noiselessness of a burglar. And when he had propped it up with his jimmy, he put his eye to the peephole and grinned in the dark. The man had sunk back weakly in the chair, breathless with a struggle to free himself, his nostrils working like the gills of a caught fish, his eyes drawn aside, in a fearful fascination, to the cat. It had gone across the room to the corner in which Pym had first seen it eating the herring, and it was smelling and licking the floor where the fish had been. When it had cleaned up every last scent there, it looked up hungrily at the string above the table, polishing its chops with a wistful tongue. The man made a gurgling noise to attract its attention, and it trotted over to him to rub against his tied leg. He tried to smile invitingly down on it with a muffled grin, at the same time that he worked treacherously at the cords that held his hands. It jumped on his knee and mewed at the fish. He jerked vainly at his bonds. The muscles in his temples swelled in an impotent effort to chew through the twist of blanket that held him gagged. It was useless. He was glaring desperately at the friendly animal when it made as if to jump from his leg to the table, and he threw it to the floor with a quick fling of the knee. Pym put his hand to his mouth, his shoulders shaking. The man was almost weeping in the helplessness of rage and fear. The cat had seated itself at his feet, looking up at the fish with its back to him, and whisking its tail across the toe of his shoe. And then the bound foot, held at the angle, wriggled to raise its heel, and when the tail came back, 
snapped down on it like a rat trap. The cat jumped with a scream of agony, and, finding itself held, writhed around to bury its claws in its master's leg, biting and scratching like a wild thing, so that the man stiffened in his pain with a start that released it, and it bounded off to a far corner, where it sat down to lick its bruised tail. Pym stifled a chuckle. The man opened his eyes and blinked away the smarting tears, his face white with passion. The cat dressed its wounds and watched him furtively. He bent forward in his chair and stretched his neck as if he were about to spring. The cat crouched. The chair creaked. The cat backed against the wall, mewing plaintively. He shook his head at it with a choked growl, and it began to crawl away toward the other end of the room. He followed it with a glitteringly vindictive eye. It darted across behind the table and skulked out of his sight. Evidently he had intended to keep it in such terror of him that it would forget its hunger, but here, now, it was safe from him and nearer the fish than before, and if he sat quiet it would be on the table as soon as it found its scent. He blinked and studied. Then, suddenly, he sat up to brace himself in the chair, and kicked out at his fetters, in a passionate convulsion, with both feet, with the unforeseen result that he threw himself off his balance, toppled over squirming, and fell heavily on his back. And the cat, frightened by the noise, leaped for shelter under the table, caught in the meshes of the lace curtain that had been spread for a cloth, clawed and rolled around in a fighting frenzy, and brought down the lamp. It broke in a flaming explosion on the floor. Now, Pym gloated, we'll see how he likes a little scorch in himself. The fall had broken the back off his chair, and when he rolled over on his face he found himself, to this extent, free, that he could straighten himself out. His legs were still tied to the rungs. His hands, pinioned behind him, were fastened to the spindles of the back but by resting his forehead on the floor he could draw his knees up under him. The bed was already afire with the splatter of blazing oil, and the room was filled with a smoke which Pym could smell through the blanket. The cat had fought itself free of the burning curtain after rolling into the mattress with it, and when the man got to his knees he turned to see the whole room behind him apparently in a blaze. He made a frantic effort to jump to his feet. The chair tripped him, and he came crashing down at full length on his face. He did not move again. "'Serve you right if I left you there,' Pym said, stripping off his coat. He took a knife from his pocket and opened it. He tore down the blanket from the window and wound it about his arm. Then he jumped into the room with his elbow shielding his face and dashed through the smoke to his victim. He released him with a few deft slashes opened the hall door, and threw him out on the landing after the cat. Having carefully shut the door again, he muffled his hands in the blanket, ran to the mattress, and rolled it up over the burning clothes to stifle the flames. He overturned the table on the bed and stamped out the fire in the bedding that lay on the floor. And finally, having smothered the burning oil with his blanket, he slipped through the window, closed it after him, and raced down the ladders with his jimmy and his coat under his arm. He dropped at the feet of Long Tom Donnelly. "'All right,' he said. "'It's all over.' "'What did you do?' Donnelly asked. "'Well,' Pym said, "'if you'll go up there and get the wadden out of your friend's jaw, perhaps he'll tell you. My own opinion is, if you want to know the facts, you'll have to ask the cat. Here, take this Jimmy a minute.' He began to put on his coat, and he stopped, with his arms halfway in the sleeves, to cry, what are you doing here? I thought I told you to stand by the alarm box at the corner. Donnelly cleared his throat. I left a cop there, he explained. I thought you'd want me here to help you, perhaps. Pym thrust his head forward to stare at him in the dim light. A cop, he said with a hoarse oath. A cop? Sure, Donnelly replied in too innocent a tone. What's the matter with that? Pym clenched his teeth and cursed him. "'Oh, you long scut,' he said, "'you vinegary face. That's what you done, is it?' He jerked his coat on with a twist of his shoulders. "'That's your game, is it?' Donnelly took a step back and changed the jimmy from his left hand to his right. 
Pim looked at him a long time, and then laughed, a laugh as mirthful as the leer of a skull. "'And that's Donnelly,' he said. "'That's Long Tom Donnelly, eh? There's a head for you now, ain't it? There's a sharp brain, eh? Gad!' He threw back his head and cackled. "'The cap'n'll laugh to hear this. Turn around and I pat you on the back, Tom, with the toe of my boot. Turn around. No? What's wrong with you? Donnelly complained. I ain't done nothing to you. I didn't know what you were up to, up there. I thought anyone would do at the box as well as me. Of course you did, Tom, Pim soothed him. Sure you did, Tom. And maybe better, eh? Especially a cop, in a game like this, eh? Well, Donnelly defended himself, why didn't you tell me what you were at? How was I to know? Sure, Pim sneered, how was you to know? What did you tell him? I told him you were layin' for a man that was trying to set his flat afire. Pim cursed with plaintive volubility. And suppose this mug goes and makes a kick now. Where'll I be? That's your lookout. Donnelly answered boldly. If you've been getting too gay, it ain't my funeral. Pim drew a long, sharp breath. No, he said, it's mine. Who's the undertaker? What's the cop's name? Slogan, Donnelly answered, with a barely distinguishable note of satisfaction. Pim buttoned up his coat. Aha, uh -huh, he said. Slogan, eh? The new man, eh? Aha! Uh -huh. He began to laugh suddenly. And that's Donnelly, that's long, thin, suety-jawed Tom Donnelly. Go home, Thomas, my boy, and go to bed. Your head'll be tired. You must have overworked it getting up a game like that. Get asleep quick, or you'll have brain fever. Donnelly licked his lips in a way he had when he was puzzled. Pim turned into the hallway. I'll remember you, Tom, he called back over his shoulder and went laughing down the passage. He had known the slogans, father and son, since the days before Cherry Hill was an Irish quarter. A half hour later he came back to the truck house with policeman slogan, and they went upstairs together to make a report in embellished detail to Captain Meaghan, who smiled through it all like the big child he was. "'You want to look out, Pim,' he said at last. "'He may raise a squeal.' "'Not while he has that plug in his jaw, Captain,' Pim said. "'Plug!' Meaghan cried. "'Did you leave the gag in him?' "'Sure,' Pim said. "'I couldn't get his teeth open.' "'And what's more,' the policeman said, with a grin, "'when it comes to talking about this business, he allus will have it in. "'I saw him. He's scared dumb. "'Mark my words, Captain. He'll never raise no squeal.' "'And, so far as the authorities know, he never did. As for Donnelly, as Pym says, they say St. Patrick drove all the snakes out of Ireland, but there's a good few of the Irish breed in the fire department, and when I step near the tail of one, I get off and away without any debatin'. There'll be another of his kind happen along some day, and put a sting in him. Don't doubt it. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Smoke Eaters » by Harvey J. O'Higgins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Private Morphy's Romance The hook-and-ladder truck of Company No. Zero, with plunging horses and a furious bell, came struggling through the frozen slush of the dark side street, shot out into the cleaner avenue, and slewed and slid wildly on the icy asphalt as it turned the circle of the corner light. "'Skatin's good,' Sergeant Pym observed. Young Morphy, once of the Red Ink Squad, was beside him, holding out from the step at arm's length and craning his long neck. Pym gripped and held him as the man on the tiller, bringing round the tail of the truck in the swing of a game of Crack the Whip skidded the rear wheels into the car tracks with a lurch that would have thrown Morphy into the street. "'Want to break your crockery on the stones?' Pym grumbled. "'What's wrong with you?' From little fukes behind them there sounded a sarcastic snicker, and when the truck had straightened out for the gallop down the avenue, 
Pim looked over his shoulder for an explanation. Fuchs said, with a wink and a leer, The blaze is down where Kitty Slogan lives. Now Pim knew that there had been a quarrel between Fuchs and Morphy, and he understood, too, that they had fought about a girl. But he had thought, from what he had heard of the truck-house gossip, that her name was Rosie, and he gathered now, from Fuchs's manner, that she was Kitty Slogan. He did not know that there had been two girls in the affair, and that Fuchs had maliciously stirred up a jealousy between them, to the greater misery of young Morphy. Pym grunted and turned a disgusted back on this introduction of sentiment and a woman into the business of the fire department. It was like such young fools as Fuchs and Morphy to be mixing their girling with the serious affairs of life. He got their measure in a memory of himself, in his first uniform, walking the longest way home to his meals on days when the wind would show the red lining in his blue coat-tails, eyeing his shadow on the sidewalk before him, and kicking up the bottoms of his trouser-legs with a swagger as he strutted past the admiration of the petticoats of the quarter. Pish! Then Fuchs said, "'It's her corner, all right,' and Pym snorted hotly. "'Suppose it was her corner. Did that make any difference to them? Their business was with the fire, not with any tow-headed Irish girl that might be in it.' Morphy was hanging out from the step again, bending forward now, in an eagerness that seemed to find the progress of the truck too slow for him. Pym clapped a hand on his shoulder. "'Look here,' he said. "'You put your rubbers on and attend to business.' Morphy drew back in an abashed consciousness of his excitement, and began to busy himself with the difficulties of getting into his rubber coat and of balancing himself at the same time against the lurches of the truck. "'And if I catch you going anywhere without orders,' Pym warned him, "'I'll report you to the old man. See?' Morphy waved a muffled arm through the tangle of his coat, but did not answer. Pym turned to Fuchs. "'That's for you, too,' he added. Fuchs laughed. "'I'm not doing any grandstand stunts.' "'See you don't,' Pym replied sourly, to have the last word, and swung out to look down the street. He could see the red brick fronts of a block of tenement houses glowing out of the darkness ahead, in the footlight glare of a blaze that was curling two tongues of flame out from the sashless lower windows, and licking in open insolence up the wall. A crowd in the street broke into a shout when they saw the truck. "'Old man Slogan has the fourth floor,' Fuchs said. Pym cursed at the headway the fire had gained. "'Cop asleep again,' he muttered and there ain't a line o' hose here yet." The driver began to draw in his horses. Captain Meaghan called, from his high place on the turntable, "'Get your twenty-footers ready, boys!' And they tossed back into the truck the hooks and axes with which they had been arming themselves, and attacked their ladder pins. Pym and Morphy unbuckled the life-net to free their twenty-footer, and heaved the half-moon of tarpaulin out on the sidewalk as the truck swerved into the curb with a grinding of brakes. They had their ladder down before the horses had stopped pawing and slipping on the gutter ice, and they drove it through the sidewalk crowd with the aid of their fellows, and raised it beside the third-story window, out of the reach of the flames, while Captain Meaghan was still shouting behind them at the men that had manned the opposite side of the truck. Pym turned the neck-guard of his helmet over his face, and ran up the rungs, his head down, his shoulders high, into the heat. It was his work, and that of the man who followed, to break in the windows of the third floor and save the occupants of it, if there were any smothering in their sleep inside. Lieutenant Gallagher was scaling the other ladder to the same end. Captain Meaghan was running to the doorway with axe and lantern. Young Morphy, biting his lip at the foot of Pym's ladder, looked up at the sergeant, looked back at the truck where the axes were, and then darted away, empty-handed, after Captain Meaghan, and caught up to him at the door. And Fuchs, grinning and mischievous, followed his victim. In the gaslight of the narrow hallway, a group of frightened women screamed and wept. Captain Meaghan charged into them with a shout that drove them back on Morphy a frantic mother among them, screeching, "'Ach, Mr. Morphy, safe my Rosie, safe my Rosie!' 
caught at the private, and before he could get himself freed from her hysterical clutch, Fuchs and the captain were halfway up the stairs ahead of him. She was the mother of the Rosie of whom Pym had heard, and Fuchs looked back at Morphy with a grin which no smoke could hide. Morphy reddened and went after him, leaping up the steps. And then there rushed out upon the landing above them a young woman, barefooted and wrapped in a greatcoat, and at sight of her he stumbled and stopped short. It was Rosie. She gave a little squeal as she came, and threw herself fainting into the arms of the captain. But Meaghan had a veteran firefighter's knowledge of hysteria, and a practical, if somewhat rough, method of treating for it. He caught her by the collar of her coat, lifted her to her feet, and shook her back to her senses. "'Now you walk down those stairs,' he ordered, "'or I'll throw you down.' And he spoke in that angry blare of voice of which Pym has said that it would start an automobile out of a balk. She clutched the balustrade and sidled down past him, her face as if blurred of any intelligent expression by her fear, and her eyes goggled in a gaping stare at him. She looked at the shame-faced Morphy as she went by him, and he shrank back against the wall with a mutter of apology. If he had been in Captain Meaghan's place... Fuchs grinned down at them, chuckling in a malicious enjoyment of the situation, and Morphy sprang at him with an oath. It is certain that there would have been a fight between them there, but Fuchs was the nimbler, and he reached the dense smoke of the landing, just as Captain Meaghan broke open a door and disappeared into the doorway with his lantern. Fuchs dodged in after him, and Morphy, blinded by his anger, ran at full tilt along the hallway to the foot of the next flight of stairs, dashed past a flaming doorway, and headed up toward the Slogan flat. The gas was burning dimly in the smoke there, and the hall was empty. He looked about him, breathing heavily, until, with the sudden understanding that he had got ahead of the others, he turned to leap up the last steps to the Slogan door and beat a thunder of blows on it with his fist. He got no answer. He put his shoulder against the flimsy pine and tried to force the lock. It gave, but held him. He stood back and butted his side into it with his full weight, and the catch snapping unexpectedly, he fell sprawling into the parlour beside a table on which an oil lamp was burning serenely, in a home-like privacy and quiet. There was a cry of fright from within. He scrambled to his feet, caught up the lamp, and rushed into the next room with it and there Kitty Slogan sat up in bed, the coverlet clutched to her chin, screaming. She stopped with a gasp when she recognized him, and she flushed to the eyes. He backed into the doorway, putting up a hand to fumble off his helmet. "'I... I...' he said. "'The... the house is afire!' She steadied a fluttering breath. "'Thank you,' she replied, in a voice that shook under a tone of icy politeness. You could have told me that without scaring me to death. He had expected her to behave as Rosie had, and he blinked stupidly at her in the sudden right about of his hopes. He wiped his forehead. You'd better tell the folks, he said. My parents are not in, Mr. Morphy, she replied. Her manner stopped him on the dead centre. He could neither go forward nor get himself turned back. He looked at her helplessly. She said, Will you please get out of here?" A burst of smoke, blowing in from below stairs, made a blue halo around the light. He put the lamp down meekly, and went out, his helmet in his hand. But as soon as his eyes were off her, a proper resentment of her treatment of him blazed up from the smoulder of Fuchs's persecution, and he clapped his hat on with a growl. It was all Fuchs's work, the little catfish and that was all he was, a catfish. He was as black as one, he had the grin of one, he was barbed like one, with a guinea moustache, and he was as slippery and as low-down, dirt-mean as one. What business was it of his if this Rosie had been making eyes at a fellow private around the gable of her nose, as she went past the truck-house door? And what but the lowest cussedness had prompted the little rat, that day when he was on the desk, and Kitty Slogan had come with a word for Mr. Morphy, had prompted him to call upstairs, Morphy! Morphy! 
here's a message from rosie for ye of course she had demanded to know who rosie was darn him it had served him right that he had had his face punched for that morphy grasped the balustrade in the hall and leaned over to glower down the stairs in the hope that fuchs might be coming up alone he imagined his own big fist covering and eclipsing fuchs's broad grin in the blow that would meet him as he rose beaming on the landing and that mental picture was so vivid that for a moment it outshone the glare below a glare which leaped and lightened in a draught of burning gases that came flaming up the stairs with the crackling of a brushwood bonfire he understood the situation when the heat took him in the throat and nostrils with a burning choke of suffocation he jumped back snorting the scorch from his nose and he ran in for kitty slogan with a yell of stairs afire that was lost in the banging of the hall door as he flung it shut behind him she screamed frantically go away you go away and slammed the bedroom door in his face look here he called hoarsely in the darkness we got to get out of here quick she cried back with that excess of coolness which had caused as many deaths by fire as the blindest fright you can get out of here just as quick as you like do you want to jump out of a fourth-story window he demanded she did not answer. He heard her bustling about inside. "'You'll have to get a move on if you don't,' he said. She called out, on a high trembling note of defiance, "'Why ain't you looking after Rosie?' He took that retort, as he had taken the puff of heat over the balustrade, in a breath of indignation through the nose, and he took it, too, as a proof that there was a pique and spirit in her that blocked his way as surely as the flame in the staircase. It was useless to argue with her. He turned back toward the front windows, stumbling with curses against the furniture. He reached a blind and tore it from its roller, savagely, and the glare from without leaped into the room, red and threatening. He threw up the sash and looked out. The house was three windows in width, and of the three directly below him, two were already in flames. The third was dark with smoke. It was to this last one that Pym's ladder had been raised, and Morphy knew that no ladder could remain there long. He shouted and ran back to the hall door. As soon as he opened it, the heat and flame struck him in his eyes like an explosion. He slammed it shut and dashed back to the bedroom. "'Come out of that!' he cried, breaking in on her, unless you want... She was buttoning the waist of her gown. She screamed, How dare you! stamping on the floor. He tore a blanket off the bed and made to throw it about her. She struck at him with an open hand and dealt him a futile blow on the side of the head. But before she could make another movement, he smothered her in the blanket, spun her around in the entangling folds of it, pinned down her arms, and, stooping, drew her forward to fall, head down like a practiced dummy, over his shoulder. She screamed a muffled protest as he rose with her. He hitched her up on his shoulders as if she were a bag of oats. He came panting to the window. He shouted, Hi! Hi! to Pym, who was clambering out of a third-story window in a cloud of smoke. Pym looked up. Who's that? he called. Morphy shouted, "'Me! I'm cut off here, with a girl!' "'Huh! Serves you right,' Pym grunted. He raised his voice. "'Get over to this other window here,' he added to himself, "'and be darn quick about it,' for the fire was growing in the room which he had left. Morphy carried his struggling load through the door of a little room off the parlour, and found the third window. He fought with the tight sash of it, but he could not raise it with a single hand. He swore angrily at the girl, and swung his elbow into the pane to send it crashing down on Pym. At the same moment he heard the explosion of the fire in the room under his feet. He climbed out on the sill as quickly as he could. He was too late. The flames were so fierce in the window below him that Pym had been driven down from it. It was impossible to put up a scaling ladder through the blaze. It would be a neck-breaking leap from such a height for any but an expert in the use of the life-net. And before the extension ladder could be raised, the fire would be all around them. Pym shouted to the men in the street, "'Here, boys! Here, you! 
Push this ladder out from the bricks. Get your hooks and hold it steady. Three of the men ran to get under the slant of the ladder and raise it out from the window, where three others braced the foot of it. Two with hooks propped it, as telegraph linemen prop the pole which they are raising. Pym climbed like an acrobat to the swaying top, twined a leg among the upper rungs, and looked up through the drift of heat and smoke. He threw down his helmet and peeled off his rubber coat. Now, he called, swing her out and drop her between me and the wall. Quick! The noises in the street hushed to a trembling silence of throbbing steam pumps. Morphy straddled the sill and swung her out limp. He held her a moment under the arms. He let her go with a gasp. She fell, fluttering in her blanket, into the smoke. The head of the ladder sank into the flames and was sprung out at once by the men below. And then it was seen that Pym, catching her about the knees in a football tackle, had taken her weight on his shoulders and his back, and held her safe. The people in the street shouted and waved their arms as Pym came slowly down the ladder with her. A squad of men ran up with a life-net for Morphy and he jumped and lit in it before the crowd had ceased its buzz of excited comment on the rescue of the girl, and looked to see what had become of him. He ran over to where Kitty Slogan stood, supported by two policemen, her hand to her forehead. "'Are you hurt, Kitty?' he cried. She drew herself up from a trembling droop, and looked over her shoulder at him, with a face that sent him back to his company with his eyes on his feet. Fuchs, who had watched the passage between them, hummed innocently as Morphy went by. "'Rosie, you are my posy, you are my ragtime gal.' But Morphy was either too bewildered to notice it, or too weak now to resent it. The fire was not put out until midnight, and for three hours afterward Company No. 0 remained at work with hooks and axes, tearing up floors and stripping walls for the last smoulder and spark of the blaze. When the final washing down had been accomplished, and the last companies withdrew, Morphy and Pym were among those detailed to watch the wrecked rooms for any reappearance of the fire. And that was how it happened that the simple-hearted Morphy, sitting alone with Pym and a lantern in the ruins of the Slogan parlour, came to tell the sergeant the details of his love affairs, and ask his advice on the ending of them. There was this Rosie, who would not speak to him, because he had not carried her downstairs. And there was Kitty Slogan. Turned me down, he said, because I'd done just that. What was a man to make of such a tangle? Pym listened with a smile, the long, slow smile of the man who sets up to be a philosopher, and takes life with a twinkle in the eye. Well, he said, when I was new to